This is the moment where I talk to you about this week's Torah portion. Like I said at the beginning when we first started, though not everybody was here, this week is Bereshit, it's the beginning. It's actually in a beginning. And I mentioned that as, as we started that this is probably the, the most well-known Torah portion with the story of creation, let there be light and all of that. The most known Torah portion, the, the least understood, by far. Like, like it's incredible. But there, are, there are, I mean, there are many parts that I would, I would need to expand upon. You're welcome to come tomorrow morning at 10:30, the Beit Alef office. This will be our time for Torah study, and we'll deep dive into this Torah portion. But um, I wanted to point a couple of passages. That have that have been so misunderstood, mistranslated, that is 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 cause a cascade of of events that have befallen us in this day. The first the first verse will have to do with how we relate to Earth. And the second will have to do uh, to how we relate to women. I don't know why I picked that, but. And the two, as you will see, are directly interconnected. Well, I can tell you why. Because the moment that we disown Earth, which we have, we also rejected women. There's a direct line between the divine feminine manifesting as creation and the divine feminine. But let's start with the first verse. I'm going to have to read it to you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. You know that verse. You've, you've, you've read that verse. You've heard that verse. You're exactly going to go, oh, yeah. And God blessed them. Talking about Adam and Eve. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. You know that verse. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over every animal. And it seems, according to this translation, that the Bible itself is telling us, human beings, that earth is for our taking. That earth was created for us to subdue her. That we need to, that it's okay for us, it's actually blessed by God, that we would plunder from the earth all that we need in order to sustain our own existence, that we were to rule over the fauna and the flora and also do with it as we will. They are there clearly to serve our every whim. Which is why this is the worst possible translation that might have ever been written about these words. And it's a translation that I don't mean to blame other people but is mostly from the Christian tradition, which means that it's a late translation, which means that it is, it, is, it is uprooted from where it came from, from the time it was written, which explains why it was so mistakenly read and understood. A better translation would be, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and master it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over every animal. Maybe we're not sure what the difference is quite yet, but I'm going to deep dive into this so you can understand. First of all, this is a blessing, right? I said at the beginning, God blessed them. This is God blessing Adam and Eve. This is God blessing us. And in doing this blessing, God is ordering, God is setting up, a relationship. In fact, a triangular relationship between God, Adam, humanity, and Earth. And it's a relationship, and I, I point to it as being a triangular relationship because it exactly is a triangular relationship. In ancient times, I've got it in my hands. In ancient times, 
Our, our ancestors had a vision of, especially when they wrote this, had a vision of a relationship that was a triangle that looked like this. It's half of, um, of our David, the Star of David. At the top of the triangle was God. At the bottom of the triangle on both sides were humanity and earth. Earth and humanity were on the same plane. And they coexisted in their relationship with the divine. We, if, you, if we read in Torah, and we'll do that a little bit tomorrow, and you, you look in the chapter 2 of Genesis, it says it clearly why God felt the need to create Adam, to create mankind. It says in the first verses, it says there was no rain on the earth, which meant that the plants and the life that were supposed to be born out of the rain had not happened yet. And there was no one, it says still in the Torah, and there was no one on the earth to till the soil in order for the plants that were supposed to be born out of the tilling to be born, which meant that God created Adam, created mankind, in order for that to happen. Just after those two verses, Adam is created. Adam is the response, Adam is the solution to this lack, to this something that is missing in creation. Adam is created so that rain could fall. What does that mean? Adam, first of all, you have to understand in Hebrew, the word Adam is short for Adama. And Adama means earth. Adama means soil. Adam is an earthling. We are, in, in the consciousness of our ancestors, we are earth that is walking, talking, and moving. Do you, and you have to really get that. We are earth that is talking, moving, and praying. But we are earth, we are Adam. We are from the Adama, we are earth beings. We are carbon beings, just like elements of the earth. And our job was twofold. Our job was one, to pray to God so that it would be rain, and to till the soil so that they would be, so that, that nourishment would flourish in order that creation be complete because everything was in potentia until we were there to ask for rain to pray for rain to have rain come down and for us to work with the earth so that the earth could produce what god had meant for it to produce so that the god's purpose of creation could be fulfilled that's why we are here so we have this relationship that is on the same plane of existence, as, of existence as Earth. We are, in fact, we are working on behalf of the Earth. We are Earth stewards. We are, we are sent by Earth to, to talk to God because Earth cannot speak. So we are, the, we are the mouth, the prayerful mouth of the Earth. And we, we didn't make that up. We borrowed it from the pagan traditions. We come from an agrarian society. We would never have a consciousness that says rule over the earth, plunder the earth, subdue the earth. We depended on earth to, to, to survive. We depended on the seasons to take place exactly when they needed to take place so that our civilization could go on. We were absolutely and completely at the mercy of earth. So we would never have a perspective of subduing earth. In fact, we would do everything we can to cajole earth you know, to treat earth well. So it's not, I have to go back to my verse, it's, it's not fill the earth. You know, when you, when you translate the word fill the earth, it means like conquer it, right? Just, you're full of yourself, right? You, you conquer, you conquer the earth. That's what fill the earth seems to be meaning. But the translation that, that is a better translation is replenish the earth. Completely different. Replenish the earth means reach for homeostasis. Reach for balance. If you're depleting the earth one way because of the needs that you have for your civilization and your being, then replenish that. 
You need to cut a tree for wood, for fire, for, for building a home. That's fine. Plant another tree. Keep balance. It's replete. It's in the whole of Torah. We treat the earth like as, a, as, a, as a living being. You know, we understand the cycles of the earth. We understand the cycle of the season, which is why we cannot translate the next one subdue it other than master it master it is a better translation because master, when you master something is that you understand its, its ins and outs you understand its, its consequences of the actions the, the pros and the cons you understand the cycles of how it works we understood the cycles of how it works we, we were asked to master the earth in the sense that we were asked to, to, to have mastery over how the whole ecosystem functioned that's what it means and so in Torah it says every seven year don't touch the land let it let it low let, let, let it lay uh, without you know tilling it because the earth itself needs to be replenished you need the nutrients to come back you need we understood that very very well no way would we have understood these verses to, make, to mean anything else than just mas have mastery of the, around this. Be smart around this. It can never be rule over everything, but have dominion over everything, which is also radically different. To have dominion over something doesn't mean to dominate something. Two different words. To have dominion is to, have, to govern something. If you're going to govern something well so that you can sustain yourself, you're going to approach it from a very different perspective than if you understand it as domination. And I'm going to quote Rashi right now. Rashi was alive a thousand years ago. He's the other French rabbi. <laughs> he lived in France a thousand years ago, and he's the, he's the rabbi Really, if any, anyone who's come after Rashi needs to know Rashi before you, you, you read anything else, any other interpretation. And Rashi says, you know, I kind of insert my words so that it flows, you know, ancient, ancient Hebrew slash French is a little bit hard, but Rashi writes, to have dominion means to rise above our base animal nature and our power hunger and take responsibility for creation, to preside over creation, ensuring a life of harmony on earth. That's Rashi. And that's written in the midst of the, the, the dark ages of Christianity, who got completely disconnected from earth. Completely disconnected. It's, it's a religion that was born outside of the realm of, of understanding earth. It's a religion that, that cut the body from its practices. That, that, that sends people to remove themselves from the world in monasteries. And it's a religion that denied nature. It's a religion that denied the body. And you know how that backfires. You know, all these vows of don't let get me going on that. <laughs> Vows of celibacy, yeah, right. right. You can't cut half of who you are off. It's going to backfire. But when you cut off the body, when you cut off nature, you cut off your sexuality, you repress your sexuality. I mean, I'm talking about the civilization in which we are living. I mean, the whole point of what I'm talking about is for us to see the roots of where we are today. The roots of where we are today stems from thousands of years ago a false interpretation of deep, profound texts that have influenced this Western civilization of ours. And we have done to Mother Earth what we have done to Mother Eve. I mean... You know, the verses fill her and subdue her and rule over her can apply just as much to earth as it applies to Eve. I mean, that's what we got from the story. 
That's what we got from that verse. You know, male domination, inspired by the verse which has God saying, and you'll know that verse, it's not good for the men to be alone. God said, I will make him a helpmate. You know that verse, right? It's just before God decides that God is going to create Eve. But first of all, God has Adam check out all the animals to see if that could be a good helpmate. Ultimately, nothing works. So there's a whole other story with Eve. It is not good that the man be alone. That's already a mistake. It's not talking about men. The Torah talks about Adam. And if, if you have read the verses that were before, Adam was this androgynous being that was just as male as it was female. It was both. Because God created them in God's image, and God is both the masculine and the feminine. Male and female, he created them. That's exactly what's written in the Torah. So for the wrong translation to just point to God, that the man was alone, Notice how we start right there to have men being victims. <laughs> right there. <laughs> and then he says, I will make him a helpmate. What does that make a woman? A servant. A maid. What the, it's not even a bad translation. It's a translation that erases completely one very, very important Hebrew word. It ignores it. Those of you who know Hebrew, the word actually is God saying, Eheselo, I will make him, Ezer, a help, Kenegdo, as against him. Literally, that's what it means. I will create for him a help against him. That's literally what, what it says. Uh, it's a little bit complex to unpack that. But I love, I went and I looked at the uh, Jewish a Jewish translation from an Orthodox Torah. From an Orthodox Torah. Here's what they say. It is not good, da da da, I will make him a help corresponding to him. They use that word kinekdo as corresponding to him. Perfect word. I love that. And I love it's from the Orthodox. You would think, right? Corresponding, meaning they are co, the two of them are co-responding, are co-respondent. They are, have the same job, they have the same responsibilities, they are partners in creation, they are corresponding themselves, but they are co-responding to the divine as well as responders to the divine. They are all intimate partners in the unfolding of their life together. They share the same purpose, they have the same respect, and an identical essence. That's what the verse is saying. And that's what Orthodox Jews are saying it means. So how did we get, how did we get to the Mechitza? How did we get? Some of you don't know what the Mechitza may be. There's, in Orthodox synagogue, there's a, literally a wall, oftentimes, that splits men from women in the sanctuary. Where I grew up, the men were at the, in, in the sanctuary, the women were in the balcony. It creates a, a certain religion when the woman has to write six feet behind the men in the streets. But that's not what the Torah is saying. This is, this is an, it, it's, it's, it's an evolution that has come from this need to dominate from the male perspective that twisted these words. And then there is Eve, not just as the helpmate, the maid, the servant, but Eve as the mother of all sins. And that comes from the story of the serpent. The story of the serpent that is so misinterpreted that it has caused so much damage. Making us believe that each of us is born out of sin, that we are all sinful beings as the moment we are born. That's not ours, by the way. Thank God. But the damage it does to those who are born into that tradition, can you imagine? 
You were broken from the start. All that because of that woman. Huh? A woman who was tempted by the snake. Not only was she tempted by the snake, that could have been something. Because the snake was probably Satan. Because he cannot be God in other traditions. He has to be other word, uh, uh, otherized. But she went and she tempted her husband. And that temptress. It's because of her that Adam sinned. It's because of her that we were expulsed from the Garden of Eden. Baloney! This is not the story this is talking about. This is not a story of a fall. This is a story of birth. This is so important. This is, this is our story of creation, okay? Every nation, every people the world over has a creation story. The Greek, you name it, everybody, the, the Egyptians, everybody had a story of creation, how this came to be, okay? This is about the story of creation. This is actually the story of creation that existed prior to let there be light, let there, you know, day one, day two. That, that, that first, the chapter one in Torah comes later. Chapter two was written before. You know how we know that? It's because when you come later with a better story, you're going to make sure your story is the one that is read first. So you wrote it later, but you, made, you, you edited the paper, you put yours first. The original story is chapter 2, which is the story of Adam and Eve, which explain the story of how we got here. How do we get here? We first are beings of light. We're beings of light. Adam and Eve are not... I know we've seen Chagall and we've seen Michelangelo and we think they actually they, they had bodies and, and everything and they were covered by the leaf of whatever. They were beings of light. Okay? And they lived in this transcendental space, luminous space. This, this pre-creation space. It's like, imagine how we are born, each of us. Right? We, we begin in that space. Call it Eden. It's undifferentiated awareness. It's non-dual consciousness. It's completely merged with God. There is no differentiation. That's why we don't know that we're naked because we're naked. But we're not even naked because we don't have a body yet. So it's, you can't read this Torah portion literally. They were naked and didn't know it. They didn't know anything because there was no knowing. This is not about mind. This is transcendental. This is deeply mystical. They were beings of light. And the story is the story of birth. That's all of our birth. Because at some point, we have to move from the non-dual sphere of Eden into here. And here is the dualistic world in which we are embodied and we fall into a body and then we are birthed out of the womb of Eden. The womb of Eden. You see, as the Torah portion progresses and God says, oh, God says you cannot eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which, by the way, is the image of dualism. So once you bite into the, tr the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you begin the process of being born. You are beginning the process of moving away from non-dual into dual, into separation. That's how we get born. And then the process goes that as they are about to... So God had said, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. What do you mean, why would we die? Because you'll be born. It's not sin, it's process. It's how our ancestors imagine this happens. In the mind of God, we are, we are born as beings of light, and then we bite into this fruit of knowledge of good and evil, into this dualistic tree. And that begins the process of getting us out of the womb of, of Eden. One of the last verses, you see, God gives Adam and Eve 
garments of skin. It's just before the leave. Up until then, what were they? So Eve doesn't sin. Eve participates in the process of them being born. And it's fitting that it would be the, fem the divine feminine that does that because that's the being that will be responsible for birthing. But what happened? We didn't understand that. We saw her as the, the evil temptress. And she was the, the god, godmother of all the others that have come after her. Let me just name several of them, starting with Jezebel and Delilah, the temptress. Like the, the, the temptress, the mystical figure, right? The, the, the archetype. Jezebel, Delilah, Corina and Salome, Guinevere and Morgana, one after the other, a, a generation after generation, story after story, the female woman temptress born out of Eve. Let's not forget the sirens. You know the sirens that are luring the, the sailors? If you look at um, depictions, portrayals of the seven deadly sins, lust is always a woman. Just go Google it. I did. Always. It's fascinating. You know the consequences of that? It's on our TV every day. The consequences of that is that you create a culture where women have to hide, have to be silent, have to hide their sexuality. It creates a culture that shames women. It creates a culture that portrays women as evil. It creates a culture that depicts women as embodying weakness. The weak sex. So that the male dominant strength can rule, where did we see that word, over them. And they're so weak that the only way they can exercise any power over the men is that they have to use their evil, temptress, sexual attractions to bring men to fall, you know, to be, um, to succumb to their lust. Which, by the way, has forevermore removed the responsibility of sexual relations from the shoulders of men. It's always their fault. Even in a culture of rape, it's always their fault. Because that's the way they can exercise power over us men. Which is why as we hear this week on TV, we are the victims. It's a very challenging time for men, as we hear. Because, you know, we are the victims of being accused. I mean, come on. If we can't molest, rape, aggress women without any consequences by keeping them silent, where are we going? Our world is coming to an end, and we can't have that. But that comes from, understand, these are, these are generations of misinterpretations that, that are born out, out of Eve. Out of our reading Eve, our reading the Bible. You know how powerful the Bible is in this country. And so what we get is red culture and slut-shaming. That's what we get, and that's what we see. We need to retell the story of Eden. We need to retell the story of Eve. We men, men, we need to stand in, in, in for Eve's everywhere. 
We need to tell the story as it was intended to be written. We need to show Eve's courage, show Eve's purpose. We men need to stand not shoulders to shoulders, but rib to rib, as in the story, with our mothers, our daughters, our wives. And every woman, everywhere, today, now, one voice. And to reclaim the Bible, to reclaim the Torah, to reread those texts the way they were meant to be understood.